Sisters of Mercy t-shirt you have on kind of betrays what you're saying. Um, right, that one. Yes, the one that you're currently wearing right now. For who? For them. <laughs> Sisters of Mercy. The yeah. That ever, I don't even like them. <laughs> um, uh, but God, I love the Sisters of Mercy. You know who else is... Uh, yeah, at least used to be constantly cited by goth people as one of the, the artists they love. The Brothers of Mercy? Well, them too. Um, <laughs> I'd love if there was an all-female cover band of the Sisters of Mercy called the Brothers of Mercy. Um, what about the Mothers of Mercy? That would be an all the that would be the dad rock version of it. <laughs> <laughs> the second cousins of Mercy. That would be the shitty, shitty cover band. Of the them. Mercy, the Mercy uh, musical universe going on here. The extended universe. Um, oh God, that'd be, I don't understand why they're, I'm guessing that's something nobody wants to think about. Yeah. The sisters of mercy still have a dedicated fan base, but they're just one of those layers of goth. I never really got into, um, layer of goth I did get into though, was Mr. Tim Burton in today's film, Beetlejuice on the spectator film podcast. Hi, Beetlejuice, every... Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Yes. Just wanted to get that out of the way. Okay. We're not going to make that joke for the rest of the movie. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Max. I'm Austin. And yes, today we're doing... And together we are the Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'll have you know that we're just like, okay, we have an opening plan. We can transition from this and we still manage to fuck it up everyone. So usually, but the thing is when we make a plan, we fuck it up in a way that's good. Whereas if we don't have a plan, we fuck it up in a way that's just like... Cringeworthy. Man, yeah. But... Anyway, yeah, today we're uh, doing Beetlejuice, one of Tim Burton's fine films. Uh, one of his most Burton movies. Yes, the most Burton film to ever Burton. Uh, this was my pick, and for once I can not even jokingly say surprisingly, because this is a kind of very me pick in a way, um, if you know me personally. Uh, we're just going to not talk too much in the opening, uh, to probably talk about our histories and then dive right into the film. Sure. Uh my personal experience with Tim Burton, I've mentioned this briefly in podcasts before, but when I was a wee lad, first starting to get interested in movies, when I was like 11 or 12, Tim Burton was the first real director where I started noticing that he had a stylistic theme that kind of went through most of his movies. He um, was the guy who you knew made different movies you liked. Yes. Um, and then you could tell something about the movie. I'm just like, oh, the, there's things that carry over. Mainly at the time, because I was a child, it was mainly stylistic and visual things. Like, he has a very distinct visual style that appears in a lot of his films, whether he's directing or producing them. Right. Um, and also, Tim Burton is the first director to kind of break my heart by becoming a shell of his former self, but that's something we'll get into a bit later. Did that happen by the time you were becoming aware of him? Um, no. Like, was he already mid-process of being, yes, like, he was. Um, replaced by a machine? <laughs> Kind of, because, uh, well, I don't think the Alice in Wonderland movie had come out yet, and that was kind of like the one where I'm just like, everybody loves this movie, but the why is it's kind of I don't bad. think anybody fucking liked that movie. There's a lot of people who do. Um, I actually have a story about that. God, you know a lot of aggravating people. Uh, <laughs> well, to be fair, you find a lot of people aggravating. Um, That's true. But if you, but to be I'm, fair. I matched with this girl on Tinder, and okay. it was going great. Uh I got her phone number. We were like texting back and forth. And then she's like, Hey, let me call you. And we started talking about movies we like. And like, we had this thing going on. Oh boy, here we go. And she, so we like to start naming movies and we are talking back and forth on our opinions on them. And she's just like, Oh, the Tim Burton, Alice in Wonderland movie. And I'm just like, you know, that movie it kind of makes me sad because it really just reminds me how far Tim Burton has fallen since his heydays. And it's just like, you can't just say that to somebody who likes it. I didn't know she liked it because we had been going back and forth. Um, oh, and she just brought it up? Yeah. Um, Ooh, you stepped into that one, man. You stepped in it. And yeah, no. And after I said that, I just hear this long silence over the phone. And she's like, you could have just said you didn't like it. Oh, hangs up on me and blocks me on Tinder. <laughs> shut down. You've been shut just down. Just because I don't like Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. Well, did you talk about it for way too long? You're probably she was probably like, Jesus, this guy no, just needs to I, start a podcast. I literally just said what I said to you, but yeah, maybe I should start a podcast so I can vent about how much I dislike. No, that. what you really need to do is you need to somehow convince me, which will never happen, by the way, of doing movies like that 
And then you'll be like, oh, I did a podcast episode on that one. <laughs> and then if they say like, oh, did you like it? You'll be like, you could listen to my episode. Yeah. That, I, I articulated my feelings in the movie much better in the podcast than I can right now. Yeah. You know, I just don't want to talk about it. It's all been said. Yeah. I'm out of words on that movie. Yeah. That's how it works. I can't talk about it ever again now. Yeah. But that's how I know I did a good job on the episode. So you can yeah. just go listen to To be to that. fair, though, if she's that passionate about that movie, I probably dodged a bullet in the end. So I try to avoid judging people based on their movie taste. That is a blatant lie. <laughs> just saying from my personal experience with you, but go on. Yeah, that's because it's you. I judge <laughs> you for your movie taste, motherfucker. You do a podcast. <laughs> I can fucking judge you. True. Other people know. Um, and by that... By not judging people, I mean that it doesn't matter unless there's like some sort of pretense where wherein it would matter. If I'm going to work with somebody on like a production or something and I have to rely on their creative judgment for one thing or another and they're like, Alice in Wonderland by Tim Burton. <laughs> I'm like, fuck you. How'd you get in my house? <laughs> Be like, go, just leave me alone. Um, but yeah, that's that's an interesting thing because his like downfall was in i mean we'll talk about this during the movie i'm sure but his downfall was like in fits and starts and different po- you know yeah. places where well, obviously like, there was like charlie and the chocolate factory but then there was also or was it willy wonk i always mix up well that one i mean but it's weird because he was already shallow and like that you know there's that, that but then point. like i like sweeney todd it's a fun movie yeah but, that's kind of like a like a sign of life yeah where it's just like oh uh, and then it just kind of fell from there yeah um, and then you obviously planned out of the apes it was just like what yeah. is this well <laughs> there was around the same time he did big fish which like it was the same ye- was it the same year it was around the same time but like big fish like along big with fish it, was the one he did after big fish and ed wood like cin- he- cinematically are probably like his best films but like ooh, i wouldn't say so i wouldn't say so with big fish i, I would really- say big fish is wannabe like good in the way that ed wood is good it's like this stupid knockoff version of Forrest Gump. I don't know. I, I found it charming and I enjoy that movie more. But we're not doing Big Fish today. No, we're not. We're doing Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice? Beetlejuice. I already lied to our listeners once, so why not keep doing it more? Yeah. But yeah, so this was this the first movie of his that you watched? No. Um, I'm not counting The Nightmare Before Christmas because that is not a movie directed by him. Um, I would, but that's a different discussion. I believe i saw edward scissorhands before this um which i also holds a place in my heart from when i saw it when i was younger um i saw this i think this was the second movie i saw by him and i did love it when i was a small child Uh, my parents were a big fan of this movie so despite all the swearing and kind of slight gore in the movie they this was allowed in my household um and yeah that kind of flourished my love for Tim Burton for when I was younger. Um, it resurged during my emo phase in high school. Um, because that's when you're already shopping at hot topic, you already have all the nightmare before Christmas. And Oh damn. You're right. Stuff. Hot there. topic would not exist without <laughs> Beetlejuice. Yeah. It's a weird <laughs> correlation, but yeah. Um, I saw a Tim Burton art exhibit at MoMA when I was in the height of my emo phase where they had all the, they had various props and drawings and stuff that he had done. That'd uh, be cool. It, no, it was. I have... That might be more cool than some of his movies. It it was, honestly. I have photos of most of it. Um, but yeah, they had like the same sandworm heads. They had all these different props from Beetlejuice. They had all the different expressions of Jack Skellington from The Night Before Christmas. It was a wonderful time. Yeah. So he was like your baseline auteur guy. Yeah. When you were like growing up getting into movies. I, I, I would say I've kind of outgrown him. He hasn't made a film that I've even enjoyed in quite a long time i would almost probably say a decade now but um sweeney todd was 2007 2008. but even that is like the oasis within the desert yeah so like what is it really did you well a lot of people like frank and weenie did you um, see frank and weenie i did um and i also saw paranorman um but paranorman I, isn't him though i think he was involved in it somehow um did he just but uh did frank and weenie just breathe on it <laughs> tim burton this wow <sighs> You went, no, 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 I think that's Henry Selnick. I think I'm confusing. Um, but, well, that, uh, yeah, that was another Leica one. Yes. So I don't know. But uh, Frank and Weenie, I, it was just, I didn't even like The Corpse Bride that much. 
The Corpse Bride kind of oh, came. The Corpse Bride. The Corpse Bride came off to me as Tim Burton getting tired of people being like, well, actually, Tim Burton didn't direct that movie for The Nightmare Before Christmas. So he's like, he's like hey, I can make that one too. Fucking fine. I'll direct one myself. Um, it yeah. kind of came off as slightly like annoying because of that to me. Um, yeah. I like a lot of parts of The Corpse Bride, but I don't think it's anywhere nearly as solid of a God, movie. I remember seeing commercials for that and being like, what is this? It's being deep. very angry at it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so... It's a tale of heartbreak, but I do think this is a genuinely good movie. And it I is. I enjoy it. It um, is. Yeah. And it shows that even directors who make good movies and have thematic uh, connections between those can fall off and just become studio shills and sure. break Absolutely. my heart. Absolutely. Just like me. Yes. Okay. So what's your experience with this movie, Austin? Well, I did not grow up with this movie. I'm trying to think of any Tim Burton movie that I did grow up with. I don't know. I, I think I watched this movie when I was like 10 or 11 the first time. And I was just kind of like, oh, that's amusing. And I kind of moved on. And then I came back to it a little bit later when I started taking movies a little bit more seriously. And I came to appreciate it, really appreciated uh, Michael Keaton's performance. Yes. And sure. honestly, all the performances, I think, are a big part of why this movie works. Yeah, so, some of them are cheesy than others, but like this movie right. kind of plays off of that and yeah, works very well. Yeah, I mean, well. that's fine with this movie. That's It's a very good movie for looking at how performance can transform a script, you know? Yes. And like make things work that you think might not work on the page. And also how key it is for good actors to sell the tone of a movie. I think this movie is the best Tim Burton movie in terms of actors carrying the workload and making it just work. They bring everything together and it's perfect. Um, it's a little bit sloppy in terms of the structure and stuff, but again, it doesn't quite matter because it's so zany and just interested in its own little ideas and set pieces and performances that that's, it's hard to fight that energy. Yeah. That's, you know, that's a thing I think we'll get into, but like Tim yeah. Burton is a very good idea, man. He's br at least he was brimming with them. And yeah, he's got like a good like mind for mashing interesting things together and then doing so in a way that feels uh, whimsy and macabre, but also not alienating to a broad audience. Yes. It's a nice mixture. And uh, the problem is if you're not like a very rigorous, you know, disciplined storyteller, Aside from that, eventually it can maybe get old. And if, yeah, eventually yeah. you'll run out of ideas. And, and eventually you just disappear up your own ass. And make two Planet Alice in Wonderland. Eights, <laughs> yeah. Planet of the Alice of the Wonderland with uh, Willy Wonka. God. But yeah, so I, that's pretty much what, I mean, that's the weird thing about Tim Burton, right? Is yeah. like, he just, at some point, I guess he just got invasion of the, he like, it's like invasion of the body snatchers. It's like he's saying to himself, like, like, what type of movie would I make if I were me? <laughs> kind of. But it's also, <laughs> it's like, it's more like a multiple personalities thing. Cause like for a while it was like, it seemed like he was trying to fight that. It's just like, eh, yeah, here's a good movie. Okay. But while, while also still trying to sort of do it. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I think for me, he's always been a type idea of a director that's like a, a phase director to use an yeah. inadequate term. Um, although one that has genuinely made really good movies and made movies that are probably underrated now because of how much of a phase director he's become in so many other respects. I'm not going to say like, cause he's not as good a director as Quentin Tarantino, but, no. um, there's, it's the same, it's the same type of thing where it's just like, I like Tim Burton movies. I don't inherently trust anybody who says Tim Burton is their favorite director. You got to give me some reasons cause it could be shallow or smart depending on what you say. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, we have to come up with a good term for that type of filmmaker, you know, and talk about like why some filmmakers are more like conspicuously like auteurish in a way that is inviting. And if you like, if you come up to me and you say Tim Burton's your favorite director because like you love all the like the fanciful worlds he's created in his films, sure, and you're not like a big film person, I accept that. You're, that's a perfectly wonderful yeah, reason I to mean, like a director. Why not? Thing, but it's also like. Again, it can go into just aesthetic, which is like, why? It's like, that doesn't make it good. No, but some people like movies solely for aesthetic. His yeah. aesthetic isn't even like super interesting after a certain point because it just becomes redundant of itself. 
Kind of, yeah. But yeah, so that's that's my history with this movie. It's one of my favorite Tim Burton movies, although I think we can both agree that we both enjoy Ed Wood the most. Probably. Um, I wouldn't say enjoy. I would say from a filmmaking standpoint, I don't think any of his other movies like hold a candle. Like I think yeah, there's cinema- really like cinematically, a- obviously Ed Wood is his best yeah, movie. In terms of enjoyment, like- I'm not going to watch Ed Wood more, more than Beetlejuice, Edward Scissor Hand. Like I'll yeah. watch a lot of his other movies. I feel like there's a really it's interesting when you see like a really strong unified like opinion on a director's best movie. Yeah. And everyone is like Ed Wood is the best one. It's interesting, but it's hard to like argue against that. I would still say that I enjoy Ed Wood the most um, with this being a second. And then Edward Scissorhands probably isn't on the map. <laughs> really? I didn't uh, realize I you would, dislike that movie so much. But. It's not that I like dislike it. I guess I just don't care. Okay. I guess I just see it and I'm like, whatever, you've got long fingers. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather watch Mars Attacks with, you know, the aliens being like, don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, he's made a, a whole number of interesting movies when he was hot throughout the 90s. Yeah. And then he really cooled off. So that's unfortunate, but that's that's my perspective on this movie. And I am very excited to talk about it, despite not being a huge Tim Burton fan in general, and definitely not being somebody who wears a uh, Brothers of Mercy t-shirt. Uh or shops at Hot Topic. I used to work at Hot Topic. Well, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Spoiler, it was the worst job I ever had. Probably not worse than a bio exorcist, though. Let's go. Ooh, that's that was a good one. Welcome to Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. The star. Max, I asked you earlier, and I thought you were lying when you said this, but did you intentionally choose this movie because Beetlejuice was on the belt of Orion as a reference to Men in Black, our previous movie? Oh, no, you caught my deep index symbolism. No, honestly, um, well, we're not going to go too deep into it because I do want to bring this up in the future, but uh, you said no to a different movie I uh, suggested, and then Beetlejuice... I can't even remember what it is. Um, but then Don't say it now. We then I think Beetlejuice was just sort of on my mind because Men in Black had the whole thing where he pulls back the skin on his face and that kind of reminded me of a scene in this. So it was just kind of in my well, memory. It's interesting you say that because we're going to see a credit for production designer Bo Welch on this movie who okay. also worked on Men in Black. There you go. Yeah. And both of those movies have pretty good production design. So, yeah, we get our very clever opening and uh, the most Danny Elfman score <laughs> that to ever Danny Elfman. Bum, 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 bum. Which, yet again, the mu- yeah, the music in this movie, whether it's his score or the <laughs> wonderful uh, other... Calypso music. Yes, that yeah. pops up in this. Um, That's this, a really good touch. Yes, it does elevate the movie. Um, and we were arguing, not really arguing, but discussing here, because there's a very obvious moment where it could be a transition, like right there. Um, but... When does it transition from a helicopter shot to miniatures? Um, yeah. I mean, it is it is very well done. Um, this stuff doesn't look quite like a miniature to me, but it looks yeah. close. Uh, it's interesting to see this, this sequence um, and how much it just fucks with your mind because of the cleverness of just beginning the movie this way in the first place. Yeah. You know? Where there are certain patches of grass that really look like miniatures. Because like here, yeah, really I mean, does. it's the lighting change here yeah. that that makes it. The lighting quality is just completely different. It's way more hard, um, and uh, you can just tell that it's you know, it's the hardness of the light is revealing the artificiality of this grass. But it's just a really great, clever way to begin a movie. It is, and then we establish one of the actually interestingly enough, prime locations of the movie in two ways where we have the house that they live in, which is the place that we have to inhabit for most of the movie. Mm -hmm. And we also have the miniature board, which is important to Beetlejuice as a character. Yeah. This, that's why hereditary is a remake of this movie. Yes. Um, I enjoy both of those movies. I do not. You didn't like hereditary. That's another discussion. Not only did I not like hereditary, but anyway, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, oh, I should assume that because I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, of course, that's my basis. If you liked it, I hate it. <laughs> yeah, that's why we make a good pair. 
That's why you have to watch every movie first, so I can know my my next move. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just going to start lying to you. I'm just going to be like, oh, I really hated that movie. Or just change your mind? No. just How like, would that work? My head would explode. I'd just be like, oh, I, I really hated that movie. And you're just like, oh, me too. But yeah. So the interesting thing about that bug moment too. Yes. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. And this is... I think I hold this opinion maybe a little bit more strongly than you do. The idea that Tim Burton is maybe not a very rigorous or disciplined storyteller. He just has like good ideas sometimes. And if he's working with somebody who's very disciplined, they come together in a coherent form. But that opening sequence is the idea. There's some subtextual ideas in that opening sequence that are not fully explored. I don't feel like by the rest of the movie, which is fine because the movie still works It just introduces these things that it just is not really interested in later on. Specifically, this idea of the bug, right? Yeah. And we kind of compared it to the opening of Blue Velvet, although that's obviously a very different movie. It is, but there is a lot of Lynchian things almost in the beginning of this. Well, both Lynch and Tim Burton have a very strong interest in Americana and like the iconography of this American image of 50s life and middle class life and... How that, how people see the achievement of the American dream in that imagery. Presented to you in vivid technical. <laughs> right. The idea of the white picket fence. Yeah. You know? And we get a lot of that in that opening sequence where we see the idyllic Connecticut town. You know? It's this rural that's village. A, that's something that's always been weird to me is like... That this is Connecticut. Yeah. Like Connecticut is like considered the sticks and like the heart of America. Like whole... Yeah wholesome American life that there's so many New York quote unquote New York movies where it's like Connecticut is the country. And it's like, like, what, what the fuck are you talking about? As somebody who lives in (laughs) Connecticut. No, it is not the country. And the part of Connecticut that fucking rich people from New York just live in. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's expensive and weird. Um, yeah, it's, it's like eyes wide shut. It's not like this, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, but yeah, so we still get that idea, though, this idyllic rural community epitomized, obviously, by Winter River, Connecticut. And uh, it is Lynchian in the presence of the bug. And in here, it's sort of subtextually, it would seem to indicate some sort of like in Blue Velvet, hidden underside to this American icon, you know, iconography and vision of this American dream that is like the closer you look at it, the more uncomfortable you get because you start noticing this underbelly that is not good. That's, Something is bad. That's it. Um, whereas Lynch would try to focus on like, there's something in the society, there's something in the town that's inherently like that. Yeah. Um, the spider looming over the house in this is a slightly more obvious metaphor of just like there's something evil and creepy that's going to overtake this house. Yeah. Soon. There's a predatory thing that's, leering over them yes exactly and then we get slightly more discomfort when we see the the impetus for the real estate agent trying to pressure them out of the house it's because they don't fulfill this idea oh that's the murderous dog but it's because they don't fulfill that image of the family yeah right they they don't have a child which the real estate agent awkwardly brings up and then yeah and then shoot out of the house well because gina davis is amazing she can communicate a lot of pain hidden behind just a like a fatic like yeah like you know sense of decorum when she's saying no we're not interested um there's a lot of hidden trauma what kind of shitty real estate agent like tries to sell your house when you're not trying to sell your house by the way that's a really fucking obnoxious one (laughs) yeah Oh, God. But yeah, we just have way more Americana here, too. We have the classic fire truck, right? Classic fire truck. The He works at a hardware store, Max. What's more blue collar than that? Yeah. With a, with a barber who's just like... Yeah. he work, He's so blue collar, he gives the other blue collar people the tools to do their jobs with. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. Does the dog kill.com? Here it does. Yes. The answer is yes, it does. It's really weird. In the screenplay, there's like this weird emphasis on this bumper sticker on their car that says like, I break for animals or something. And they bring it up like three times before. It's like, oh, that was weird. Well, yeah. And And then you don't even see it. 
You just see it there and you can't even read it. Yeah, if you invert the screen. I break for animals. But uh, we have our little uh, Carnival of Souls reference. Sort of. Kind of, but... um, (laughs) I had forgotten uh, until I saw this movie a couple years ago because I guess, like, growing up, I remember them being alive for a much longer period of time. No, it's right away. Yeah, it's just like, oh, here are our characters. They're dead now. I like that. I like that they just get it over with. Then immediately we change the colors just a little bit. Yeah. Tim Burton, because he's an auteur and he has a strong visual sense, always works within a color palette. And I feel like even though that's something that's, you know, that's that he has lost focus on as he's become a worse and worse director, um, he's still always focused on working within a color palette. And I think for a movie like this, it's very incredibly helpful for just communicating things about like tone and mood and, you know, sometimes character moments. Yeah. Eventually, like that's the kind of the thing with the Alice in Wonderland movies. It's just like, okay, uh, get these like this bright palette of colors against black and white pinstripes. It looks like this, but shittier. Yeah. Um, and th- then people will say it's a Tim Burton movie and you can go home and you don't need to. Yeah, it's just the invasion of the body snatchers. It's just like Tim Burton is like, tells a bunch of other people in the room, like, do my thing, people. Yeah. And then he leaves. <laughs> this scene, they got too many horses. <laughs> I'm just going to say this. They do. Um, that scene always bothered me because, like, that's kind of just like. It's shot in a way where it doesn't really look like you can't, you can barely tell that like you can't see her hand in the mirror. It's, it's a weird thing, but, um, Oh, you thought it was too obvious. Yeah. Um, and also apparently he can't read. He says handbook for the recently diseased, <laughs> but yeah, he works at a hardware store in the sticks of rural America, Connecticut. Connecticut yeah. So obviously he's not that intelligent. It's like deliverance out here, everybody. Also, I always forget this is fucking Alec Baldwin. Cause he's not playing Alec Baldwin in a movie. He's playing. Cause like, he's not saying fuck you. That's yeah. my name. Yes. He's just trying to be sincere, <laughs> <laughs> which is very un Alec Baldwin. They make it for a very charming couple though. They do in this movie. Again, I think this movie is perfectly cast. And the movie kind of like ignores them for the last act of the movie because they stop being important and it more focuses on Winona Ryder's character and be and Michael Keaton being Michael Keaton. Yeah. But um, no, they carry the first part of this movie very, very well. Yeah, this movie definitely has a weird structure. And that leads into part of it just being like, he, you know, Tim Burton's a guy full of ideas and he just took the script and they had to get rid of the weirdly racist things in the original draft and all the other stuff. Well, he didn't write the original script. No, he didn't. Yes. Um, but he did have to fix it. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this that's the other thing is that there's multiple different tr- versions of the script for this. And a lot of them are very weird. Even from, like, the second one, right? It's like... It still doesn't feel like the Deets are a very charming family in the way that they come across in this movie. Um, it still feels like not a very strong script to me. Um, I feel like it's really carried by the actors and the visual sense. I think that's a huge for this movie. We but, were talking about like, yeah, I was about to say, was there a reference there in the paper or what? Oh, I wasn't going to say that. Uh, but, I mean, I'm sure there is. I don't know. Do you think that's a Night of the Living Dead, Dead reference that she's Barbara? They referenced Night of the Living Dead yeah. in this movie. So you don't know. Well, they don't know about Night of the Living Dead. Um, they don't know about it, which yeah. is kind of weird. Because it, just... it would be their era of movie more than Winona Ryder's movie. Because uh, she would have been like... It wouldn't have been theirs either, to be honest. Well, they... They're like in their 30s, right? Yeah, so like if they were in their like what... Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah, they would have been like... I mean, it would have played on a circuit. It wouldn't have been like it was out for like you know, four months or whatever. It would have been playing at midnight theaters for forever. But, they but that's beside the point. What I was going to bring up with the paper is this idea of continuing the subtext of what death means for them and how it serves as a barrier of entry now for like achieving the American dream that they were very close to. Right. And they, they don't want anything to change despite the fact that they're dead. They just like, they just want to live in the house. Yeah. And, be content, but they can't. Yeah. So death, 
because this movie is not really focused on having a subtext, it's not quite like channeled in a direct way or focused at all, but death sort of becomes to operate as this type of like, like lev like lever that sort of like you could talk takes privilege away from them kind of well you could also talk about how like their actual death is a metaphor for the death of like the like happy american dream and then just like these obnoxious city folk come and sort of gentrify it and take it away from them yeah i mean i but it's not even to the point where i would say it's a metaphor it's just it's subtextually it's indicative of that, but yeah. it's not like there's a one-to-one -one relationship or anything where you can point to like, Oh, this specific thing in a way that seems like intentional or, uh, I guess articulated by the movie, um, feels like a choice or something, you know, the movie mm -hmm. doesn't really communicate in that way. It's more just focused on the characters and then in the, how the characters interact, they sort of reveal different subtext, but because the way, the movie is organized is just kind of like going back and forth at certain points. The subtext just becomes like, Oh, they get their daughter. You know what I mean? It yeah. becomes that they find their family that they wanted at the end. It's like a synthesis of families, but it doesn't really say anything that's like different about their family versus. Well, everybody gets the what they want so the much. End. Yeah. She gets like parents that like care about her in a way that her actual parents did don't, yeah. didn't. Um, she also gets to fly through the air. They get they, they get the family they wanted, and they get to stay in the house. The right. father finally gets to relax, and the mother actually starts making good art, right? And gets featured in art magazines. So everybody gets something that they want. Yeah, and this is the only other time, as far as I can tell, that the spider imagery is continued. Yeah, this okay. is amazing. By the way, we have to just pause for the amazingness of how bland and just not good that artwork is yeah <laughs> it's like expertly crafted to be terrible yeah it's like we were really actually impressed by how like like amazingly stupid it is i love that delivery where he's just like he's, he's like, like he's tapping his toe <laughs> time to relax i'm relaxing finally <laughs> time to get down to business and just relax yes i have it marked on my calendar it's relaxing time here we have otho He's great. He's probably the closest thing to an outright villain. Yeah. Aside from Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice sort of. But like Beetlejuice is like, he's yeah. so fun. You forget he's a villain because it's like all of his scenes are great. Yeah. Also, we should note that most of Beetlejuice's dialogue was completely ad-libbed by Michael Keaton. Um, yeah. He definitely makes this movie while also, oh, I love this detail that she licks him. <laughs> she, she was too like, she chastised him for trying to kiss her earlier but, in front of people, but, but then she lick licks his nose to get what she wants. Um, yeah. Well, it's implied that they do have kinky sex on the regular basis. That's the last thing I want to think about with Jeffrey Jones. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Because Winona Ryder, like rather than just being like, Oh, I can't believe they're doing this is like not again <laughs> when she starts hearing moaning from the other room. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a thing that's canon in the Beetlejuice universe. You know, you have to live with that now, Austin. <sighs> This is a fun moment where we have the anticipation of like scares coming in a yeah. horror movie sense, but it's in this safe, like comedy, weird, wacky movie setting. Yeah. Well, this movie like was written as a horror movie, I think, and then was sort of changed to be a comedy later yes. on. Okay. I don't know if it was written as like a straight up horror movie, but it definitely was way more focused on that. And in the original draft, there's like... You know, uh, Lydia is, I don't even feel like is the main character. No, like, she had siblings in yeah, the Yeah, she original. had a sibling, Kathy. Yeah. Kathy's Who curse. was much younger. Yeah. Um, and uh, she had all the important shit to do that Lydia does in this. Yeah. Uh, I loved that visual gag. Just like, oh, well, we're going to push the woman hanging like she's a piece of clothing. Yeah. Like this movie sets everything up, right? We've already set up the wedding dresses. We've set up our characters perfectly because even though they're characterized in broad strokes, these actors are great. Yeah. So they're coming to life. This movie sets everything up, but the direction it goes in is not like a focused one, but that's okay because what it sacrifices in like plot focus or like subtextual content, it really feels like it makes up for in its tone and just how like, fun it is to watch on a scene to scene basis. I mean, in terms of how memorable the character interactions are, I feel like this is one of the like most memorable, like 
movie families of the 80s, which is probably saying something because people were fucking obsessed. They loved those 80s movies. Yeah, with like family 80s movies. She's never likable throughout the entire movie. But <laughs> no, she's not. She gets it's weird because she gets what she wants by the end of it. But yeah. like in a traditional movie, she wouldn't because you hate her. You really buy that she's the type of woman that would go on a vacation and leave their kid home alone. Yeah. <laughs> and not even think about it. It's just like, well, I'm going on a vacation. Why and, would I bring my kid with me? And realize on the plane and then scream, Kevin! <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Are we going to do Home Alone? I don't know. When our podcast gets enough <laughs> listeners to finally get Macaulay Culkin on it? No. He's not invited. I would invite him. I would love to hang out with Macaulay Culkin. Are you kidding me? He seems like a wonderful No, guy. I'm not kidding. He's not invited. Uh, I don't like him personally. Aw. What did he ever do to you? He fucked up my Subway sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> oh, man. Fuck you. Macaulay Culkin, if you're listening, I enjoy you. Wonderful. <laughs> and you seem like a great person. Sure, he does. I'm sorry that your parents stole all your money. That's a shitty, shitty thing. But anyway, yes, we're <laughs> we're, we're getting the we're getting character. What? <laughs> Nothing. But we're he's trying to force himself to relax and not work, and is failing miserably at it. Um, and then we're reintroduced to Lydia, who I mentioned to you before. Would it be surprising to have you learn that she was like? One of my first childhood crushes. It explains a lot about me as a person. Well, people listening to the podcast won't understand. But if you saw Matt Max in person, you'd be like, oh, my God, it's Lydia Dietz. <laughs> and then you'd be like, oh, wait, no, that's a man. Yes. And he has a beard. And uh, yeah, I'm lazy about shaving. But and he doesn't have like bangs that he, he like turns into like triangles. I can't pull off bangs, unfortunately. Um, but, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. She has, yeah. No, yeah. It, <laughs> it's Lydia Dietz, uh, Raven from Teen Titans, uh, just all the classic. Oh, you grew up to be a weirdo goth kid. Um, but yes, here we get first taste of sandworms, which are wonderful visual things that like... I hope no- the new Dune movie just looks like this. Yes, why not? We we should do Dune eventually. Um, why? Because it's fascinating. The uh, David Lynch Dune, yes. you're saying? It's oh, d- geez, just Louise. a weird, bizarre... We, but that can't be our first David Lynch movie. No, it won't be, but I am putting that on the list of things we need to get around to doing eventually. But yeah, so... so uh, I like the sandworms are never explained. Like, that could have been a... Or just the whole thing is never explained. Yeah. It's just like, you can't leave the house because fuck you, sandworms. Well, okay, so Michael Keaton says... He calls that place Saturn. Yeah. But it can't be Saturn because Saturn's a gas giant. So is it a moon of Saturn? I mean, I he, don't know what it he is. He probably ad libbed that line and it didn't really matter. Yeah. So. It doesn't matter. And here's the thing that I noticed because that is her actual mother. Those are her actual parents. It's not a stepmother. No, it is her stepmother. It's. I don't think it is. No, no. it is. That's why she calls her Delia by first name. Stepmother. I don't. There's no indication, re- the, but the movie doesn't explore it. You know what I mean? It brings it up as a detail, but there's no real, like, reflection on their relationship between the daughter and stepmother, you know? But it is a stepmother. We have no idea what happened to the mother. I'm not... Because I maybe missed a a line of dialogue or something. Um, Max, I can guarantee you right now that it's the stepmother. I will... If I am completely wrong, then... Uh, you're completely right. Yeah. So now you have to eat your shoe. I never agreed to that. Yeah, but. you did. You did beforehand. You said, Matt, Austin, if I say anything that's wrong in this podcast. Everything I say is wrong in your eyes, though. So I would I eat will my shoe. Compl- eat my shoe on air for the listeners. And you can turn that into a big selling point for everybody. <laughs> also, who owns those cows? Now I'm suddenly curious. That's the we're, spectator film podcast. Everybody asking the hard hitting questions about Beetlejuice. I like that guy's hat though. Look at <laughs> that. It looks like he's got emojis on it. That's neat. Probably not though. Pre emoji emojis. A construction worker with emoji hat. Circa 1988. And then we introduce that Delia is an actual artist, not just for the sake of being an artist, but because photography is something she actually enjoys. You mean Lydia? Yes, sorry. 
Delia is Love. an artist who wears a sleeve that's black with an otherwise white shirt, which is just the weirdest thing. Yeah. But she's an artist because like it's a trendy thing to do. Like yeah, she's just a New York rich yuppie person. Yes. Yeah. Um. Whereas Lydia is like genuinely passionate about her photography. And Again, like, another very Burton esque touch, yeah. right? Where you have creative people who are outsiders. Etc. Et I was going to wait until we get a singular moment with Lydia to explore that because it, it yeah, is a common theme in a lot of Burton's movies. And you pointed out the <sighs> product, product placement here. Lipton iced tea, everybody. For when you're trying to relax in the countryside. Of Connecticut. Yes. <laughs> we have Ginger Twist ready for We're you. We're not going to let that go because like, as people who live in Connecticut, this could not be like... Because further. there's no tea in Connecticut. <laughs> That's a fact. Yeah. People say that people from Connecticut don't have accents. We just don't pronounce the letter T for whatever reason. What? Anyway, that's a that's a thing. Um, but yeah, what is this hat? Sorry. <laughs> she was trying to take a picture of it. You got me distracted from it. But yeah, this is uh, I think for me the most visually exciting moment, just because of the like insane like contrast needed to get Lydia in her like all black outfit with this blue sky. And then the white house yeah, contrasted against the green. This is like, I, I know why they couldn't make the entire, that movie, so, like the entire movie. So crazy in terms of the color palette, but that those few shots is like, Whoa. Yeah. The exposure must've been a fucking nightmare for that, but they pulled it off. Well, you can tell that it like there are certain parts of the shot. And this is part of what's interesting is that they couldn't, properly exp- like expose yeah. it looks like they couldn't properly fit like Lydia's outfit 100% within the exposure for the house so there's in a few of those shots it almost looks like the black she's wearing is like melting into itself yeah. and it's like infinitely black it's kind of interesting she's the black void just like her soul yeah uh, but just enough for you to sort of barely I love that it. I love that fun like oh they're doing this so there's gonna be smoke but it also <laughs> has like it looks cool in the shot and yeah I mean that's the other thing about Tim Burton right where we're talking about the changes where he used to tackle material that you think would not necessarily require his you know quote unquote vision yes. right and then he would apply his vision to that material and then there's this change where it seems like he just asks himself what would it seem like i would do and then he doesn't try (laughs) so he just does it the way you expected it would be what would a tim burton do in this situation yeah what would i do if i was myself here i still think it's it's a dr jekyll and mr hyde thing where it's just like just half ass it and make all the money. No, I'm an artist. I need to create things. Yeah. But here we get our first little taste of uh, Michael Keaton. We were talking about, uh, yes, because Michael Keaton is wonderful. And he's amazing. After uh, Birdman kind of revitalized Michael Keaton, there was yet more talks of making a second Beetlejuice movie. And I kind of feel like the time has passed for that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, because we're talking 2016 would have been the perfect year to do that. Because you got Winona Ryder is back. High, high, yeah, right off of Stranger Things. And you have him, fucking Birdman, wonderful breakout, or re-breakout role for Michael Keaton. Yeah. And then it's kind of faded now. So if you do it now, it would just kind of be like, oh, well, why is this a thing now? Yeah. I mean, they've also, been trying to make a sequel for years. Yeah, of this. I'll, yeah. I don't trust modern Tim Burton to no. make a sequel to this movie. And I mean, just to speak to what we were saying, if you want to look at like subtle ways, Tim Burton touches express themselves, look at some of the shots of them in this attic, specifically the one right before Lydia is trying to open the door. We didn't point it out, but obviously something that Tim Burton loves throughout a lot of his movies because he constantly references it is just German expressionist movies in general. Yes. This attic set is very much reminiscent of German expressionism. It's not nearly as obvious as the hallways. Yes. We're going to get later in a, but but it's also very much a German expressionist touch to have things cluttered in this specific way. There's lots of weird geometry. Yeah. The angles yes. closing in in different angles. And yeah, it's not ways. as conspicuous, but it's definitely there. No. So again, he's taking, he's applying the same very conspicuous dramatic decisions with his style 
and he's bringing it to like a domestic setting yeah. in a way that works because you don't necessarily notice it here where you notice it in other spots. So, you it's know, not as, it's not yeah. as obvious as uh, the hallway of Dr. Caligari that happens later on. Yeah, in the movie. exactly. Um, so it's like, this is the example of good Tim Burton. This is what he does in his good movies. So he brings that and he brings it into a setting that you might not expect because he's actually being creative. Dun, dun, dun. It's what the hell is the stuff? Like, I can't... Modern I just, art monstrosity. I know that's the joke. Yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't question it. I should just shut up. <laughs> I love how it's impossible for him to relax. Is it's, he like the forerunner to, to the uh, dad from Jimmy Neutron? <laughs> ducks, 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 Jim. Jim, ducks. I like ducks. You like ducks. We all like ducks. You, you bring up the weirdest fucking references. <laughs> There's that one episode where you wouldn't shut up about Flubber for the longest time. Like, What episode was that? I don't know, but I don't want to remember it. But uh, <laughs> did you know Jeffrey Jones was in Flubber? He's not. I'm sorry. I just said that. Doug Jones actually was, was the Flubber in that movie. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh man i do love that he's like a real estate person person and then he immediately starts like creeping on the entire town he's just like oh look out this, this it's almost like he chose bird watching as a thing to try to get into just so he could have an excuse to walk around with binoculars and be like i'm looking at properties instead well i think it's just supposed to be the obvious thing of like yeah. he can't here's the thing where it's just like if you yeah. want to point out like oh why why aren't the deets is constantly wet and literally tim burton decided not to make them wet because he didn't feel like making the actors uncomfortable for the entirety of the film well also as if you would have the authority to do that to like a big actor you got for your thing yeah they could be like no i'm not doing that and then the conversation is over regardless of whether you want to do it or not but yes, everybody else is a caricature of how they died. Yeah. Here's the other great Tim Burton touch, right? Is just really, uh, I don't want to say well-drawn or fleshed out extra roles, but very well conceived. Yeah. You know, you can, you get the concept from how everybody is dead here. And even though we get basically no rules about how the afterlife works, and that is to the extent where it's like kind of confusing to me and very convoluted. I think it's like you still get a lot of information out of how these people are just waiting here and how they've died. I don't see. I kind of like the fact that like, cause the afterlife obviously has rules and right. all of these people are very aware of them, but it's like such a bureaucratic nightmare that like, that not even the audience can hope to understand. Yeah. Like why, yeah. why would you, how could you possibly know? Yeah. Well also that's, speaking to the subtext of this, right? We were trying to think about like, what are possibilities for reading, you know, the way that the, the Maitlands are kind of coded, right? So in some ways they're kind of coded as immigrants, sort of. There's this idea of them being new arrivals to the area because they have died, right? And how their arrival there now jeopardizes their ability to achieve the American dream. You know, if you think about them dying as them moving to a new destination, that is like sort of a new ideological dimension. I wouldn't go with immigrants. I would go with more like outsiders is a good thing, but I would go if we're going off the metaphor of just like, yeah, I'm saying that we were like talking about this, and there's no real good comparison. Yeah. But immigrants is maybe a starting point. And it does really, you're right when you say that it amounts to like just being an outsider in general. But <laughs> Do you think Marlboro play, yeah, paid for that product placement of the well, guy? Well, it's not Marlboro. It's, uh, that's Marlboro. That's the, uh, that's the cigarettes he was smoking. Marlboro that one? Yeah. No, they're all smoking something else. In this movie, they're all smoking. Um, that's literally Marlboro Reds right yeah, there. Yeah, that's a Marlboro. But, uh, I thought I saw in the throughout the rest of the movie they're smoking a different brand. Either way, I just want to bring up that Miss Argentina is like perfect. She's perfect in this. Yeah. <laughs> Completely like she I think is as important to selling the tone of this movie as everyone else. This entire she's on waiting room for scene like 2 seconds. Yeah, this entire waiting room scene is fucking wonderful. <laughs> 
I just love how everybody is just like, obviously. <laughs> everybody tells a story just by looking at them briefly. It's wonderful. <laughs> Here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love the little scallop ones. They're wonderful. Yeah, so the thing about this bureaucracy is that Try it's and funny. lose this one. I never noticed that on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Does he? No, he doesn't. Maybe he was going to try to lose that one. <laughs> well, I think it's just supposed to be a joke on the paperwork to just like uh, lose the paper because it's hopeless bureaucracy. This will never find the paperwork. Yep, and here we go. But yeah. German expressionism. Do you get it? Also, keep your eyes peeled on the right. When it cuts, you're going to see the cool Freddy Krueger door. There it is. But uh, what were we talking about? I forget. Uh, we were talking about the fact that they are outsiders to yeah, this bureaucracy. Not, not so much immigrants. Um, but again, it is this idea that they're like, they are newly arrived here. Yeah, well, It's I, kind of fish out of water. Yeah, but I was thinking like back to when I was saying that you have uh, them as sort of like them living in this rural part of like real America and trying to achieve that dream. And then the city slowly encroaching on that and taking that away. Yeah. The city can also be represented by like this pre-established uh, bureaucracy that's always been there. They just don't know how to navigate it because they've never been a part of it before. Yeah. It's never applied to them. It is. That's an interesting way to put it too. It's like they're country folk. Yeah. And then uh, it's the urban parts of life that are interfering with their ability to continue their idyllic country existence. Yes. The, the vast countryside of Because ideologically, the, the, the movie's attitude towards the bureaucracy is kind of just mostly there to take pot shots at it as a joke. Oh, here yeah. we have Sylvia, Sylvia Sidney, who is amazing, I think. But um, it's, it's kind of neutral towards the bureaucracy in general overall, wouldn't you say? It's kind of just like, it's not political with it, but it's just sort of like, the bureaucracy functions, but yeah, it's bloated and inefficient and it's meant to be Because it way. doesn't actually help them, no. but it does help us because she provides lots of exposition. Yes, and you were talking right. about how uh, she died of lung cancer and was just constantly smoking. Pardon so, me, Max, that I misspoke. She died of esophageal cancer. <laughs> yeah, okay, but... Do you think that she was just like constantly smoking on set and then like halfway through they're just like, oh, we can do a neat thing with the fact yeah. that your throat is slipping. Well, we're not going to stop you anyway, Sylvia. Well, so we'll have yeah. smoke come out your throat. But speaking of German expressionism, she was definitely cast in this and other Tim Burton movies because she worked with Fritz Lang. Yes. Um, well, Tim Burton. I think she worked with him multiple times. The one I can think of off the top of my head is a movie called You Only Live Once um, with Henry Fonda, I believe. That one's not bad. Fritz Lang made a ton of neat movies in Hollywood. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, what was I going to say? You have this... Uh, the prosthetic. The prosthetic. You have the... Normally, I can't stand exposition dumps in movies, but like her delivery is so charming and genuine. It's so dry. All. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you totally buy her as the character. Well, we were talking about this, how impressive it is to just see, like, an actor who can transition from, like, golden age stuff to just different parts of, like, American Hollywood filmmaking. Yeah. Like, that's why Jimmy Stewart quit, is because he couldn't, like, Marlon Brando came along, and then there was James Dean, and then the idea of what acting was changed Right. Yeah, and then like going even farther back, yeah. like Charlie Chaplin. Like, oh, we have movies where I have to talk now. Fuck. Uh, yeah, I don't want to do that. Fuck <laughs> that. Yeah. And then I love this too when the non diegetic lights for the for the origin story, the the Maitlands notice them. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of just fun details like that. Well, like even like the waiting room does it well, but like the gag I brought up where like the smoke pours out of yeah the slit in her throat. In another movie, like the movie would like have a scene where that's the joke. Where right. It's like she'd be smoking a cigarette and the lungs come out and it'd be just like, how do those even work for you? Uh, but no, it's like she's delivering important exposition, but that just happens because it's a thing that would happen. And yeah. it's fun and I love it. But that's the, uh, that's the good Tim Burton touch is that it's sort of like he tries to do weird things, but it's always from 
you know, a baseline, very accessible, sort of familiar place, you know, in terms of how he makes his movies. He makes broad appeal movies, but he adds, you know, little touches at them. So if you, we are going to compare him to Lynch in terms of how he sort of tackles similar subject matter, um, Lynch is very much about defamiliarizing the things that are familiar yes. and making you uncomfortable with it. Whereas, you know, Tim Burton is about taking the weird things and rendering them in a familiar way. Yes. That you can sort of look at from a distance, which is why obviously Tim Burton is more, I don't know, family friendly. <laughs> this feels like just a family movie. If I had to categorize this movie, I'd say this is a family comedy. Yeah. Well, it's, rated, you know? it's rated PG. Which is weird still. It's a weird PG, but yeah. you're right that it is definitely within a certain like boundary of what could be consumed by a family. I watched it when I was much younger. Um, so and look how I turned out. I turned out fine. It honestly didn't affect me. Yeah, you're, look at you. You're a real estate magnet or whatever. You're Maxi Dean. Oh, my God. This guy looks like fucking uh, J. Jonah Jameson <laughs> from Spider-Man. <laughs> he looks like, like Tom Selleck. Like a poor man's Tom Selleck. Hashtag Maxi Dean. We need to stop using hashtags and everything. That's just the bad joke. Is when you can't come up with a real joke, you just come up with hashtag this, hashtag that. Yeah. Do you know I watched the Netflix comedy special the other day and they went through the entire thing, the person's entire performance, and they had hashtags for different jokes they made? Almost as if it was like, tested and made beforehand specifically so they could have hashtags. Oh god. I just wanted to vomit all over myself. Hashtag vomit all over yourself. Why didn't you just like take off the sheet? That probably would have scared him. <laughs> just to see a random person? No, like take off the sheet and there's nothing under there, then he'd just be like, "Oh, I'm not yelling at my weird goth daughter." But what if it was even just like a man? What if it was Alec Baldwin? He'd be like, who the fuck are you? Alec Baldwin, get out of my house. Yeah. And then here's the other fun stuff. God, the artwork in this house. Yeah. This is definitely like the type of nouveau riche family that like owns paintings by Mark Ryden. I hate those people. Start a list, everybody. Go th go throughout all the podcasts and make compile a list of everything that Austin says he's hated. Please do. It will be longer than any one of our podcasts to read through. That's not going to be true. Yeah, it's entirely true. I'm trying to mope in here, guys. Can you please be quiet? It is interesting, too, to see this idea of, like, the sense of play and aesthetics that these people have. And, again, the idea of, like, failed artists that isn't quite explored throughout this movie, but you know, they're failing at, in their performance as ghosts to yeah. get the response they want. And they're confused with the TV. So you have like this postmodern thing where it's like this image of a ghost is no longer effective because it's been assimilated too much, uh, into just culture, et cetera, et cetera. It's just white noise. Well, it's also like, and then they're immediately aestheticized here by, Winona, who then uses her photography skills to actually learn that they're ghosts in the first place. So you dun, get dun. this like interesting like play with the idea of like artistic perspective and what it what it gets you in this movie. But it, again, it's not the focus. It's just it's there to serve the character interactions. And that's okay if you have good actors and stuff. Yes. Speaking of good actors, Winona Ryder is delightful in this movie. Um, she is very good. But I wanted to bring up her thing because it's a common theme for Tim Burton films, most exemplified in Edward Scissorhands because that's the plot of the entire movie. But, is um, that he's got, is he's a goth guy? No, obviously. But um, you have, he talks about this a bit on uh, a book. Uh, that I have called Burton on Burton, where he's talking about his career, um, how he takes somebody who's the other, who's ostracized for something that's weird about them. In Edward Scissorhands, it's obviously that like he has no social skills and literally has scissors for hands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one is greater than the other. Um, <laughs> but um, he's ostracized. They, they are ostracized by the people around them until that weirdness becomes useful. Right. And 
marketable. And then people act like they've loved them all along until that inevitably falls through. We have that with Winona Ryder's character where her parents are ignoring her. They don't really care that she's like out of place and doesn't have anything. Until they can exploit her. Yes, until the fact that she can see and communicate directly with the ghosts, uh, they find a way to monetize that. They're going to build a ghost theme park in the house. And And an insect museum. Yes. See it on his board later. It's going to be a creepy place. Yeah. But um, so that's a common theme throughout his movies. Um, but that's also interesting too. Now they mention it, it's not quite related, but it just reminded me that also a similar thing that happens with uh, the Maitlands and something that sort of violates their agency as characters and makes makes them outsiders is their relationship to their body, which obviously in Edward Scissorhands. You know, that's a big similarity where you see there's a direct relationship between Edward Scissorhands and his body and his inability to actually, like, integrate properly with society and interact with other people. It's a big barrier because sometimes... It's the most Tim Burton machine to ever Tim Burton. Yeah, it's your car. (laughs) You don't have to tell anybody that. rode up on that thing today. But I spent a terrible amount of money getting that. (laughs) I made a terrible decision. I destroy every highway I drive down. <laughs> and you blow the debris back <laughs> on the cars behind you. <laughs> the amount of times I got pulled over on the way here. None, because the cops can never get you because <laughs> yeah. you're just blasting rocks at them. They never follow me. It's weird. Yeah. I do love her response to this when she's like, don't you dare talk to people about me. <laughs> oh, God. And then we have the... the the house gets more and more ridiculous. Like the more rooms. Yeah. We didn't mention it, but like, I think this was more of a problem for me when we were watching it the other day than for you. But the like weird, like graininess of the walls, some of the walls just made my head want to explode. I like couldn't look at it. I can't stand that. And we're finally getting more Michael Keaton. He's only in the movie, I think, for like 17 minutes. Yeah. He's like the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Sorry. I finally had gotten that theme song stuck in my head and you had to <laughs> reintroduce it. <laughs> I hope you're happy. So we didn't mention it when uh, Juno was giving the backstory, but I have lots of questions about Beetlejuice. I don't, but go on. So why do you have to say his name three times? For him to do this? Why can he do this? Why is he not like everyone else? Everyone else seems to be stuck in their bubble of where they died. Sort of. Right? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. Obviously, he killed himself. Yes, because he was originally a social worker. Apparently, right. he was the assistant to Juno. But then apparently, he decided that he could break out of it. and And he had the power to do that. Because clearly Miss Argentina doesn't want to work there. Yeah. But she can't leave. But he can. Is it the longer that you're dead, the more like power you have? Here's the thing, though. Uh, this is why I kind of don't want a sequel to it. <gasps> oh, God, I don't want to look at it. Oh, don't. Don't spoil the cardboard. Oh, no. Oh, God. Sorry. I have a lot of like weird anal things I can't deal with in movies, but like that's... I just don't understand. It's just like... It's like... Nails on a chalkboard. I just can't look at somebody dig a little bit into cardboard and there's just like, ruin it. There's like certain things I can't look like secondhand embar. Like I get secondhand embarrassment terribly in movies. Literally to the point where you're like, look at you and you're like sweating. Yeah. There's like foam coming out of your mouth. You're like, I can't do this. Like I can't, like I physically can't do that, but like I, I just don't understand it. Oh, um, well, get ready, Max, because we're going to do so much embarrassment it's like uh it's what like uh tragic mis- mis- miscommunication when in the 90s like oh god you hated lamillion so much because it's just like the lottery it's ticket like, yeah going it's back just forth. tragic miscommunication you're like it's movie. in the jacket <laughs> it's in the fucking jacket i'm gonna kill you oh uh, uh, yeah no oh god it's beetlejuice yay michael keaton i love you buddy with his green hair yeah we, we covered talked, in spores. We, we had talked about before that they had the idea of what Beetlejuice would look like before they cast Michael oh, Keaton. Oh, God. So there's so many weird stories. This is the other re- like weird thing about this movie is how close it was just 
to being awful. Yeah. So like originally I shit you not in the original version of the script, Beetlejuice is described as like a short middle Eastern man. And what the hell that has to do with anything? I have no idea, <laughs> but that's how he was described. And you then, can't blame Tim Burton for that because he did not write the script for this movie. And yet, Tim Burton originally wanted to cast Sammy Davis Jr. What the fuck is that? What the, is, what the hell kind of sense does that make? I have no idea. So, and then they wind up casting Michael Keaton. Oh, Max, this is the best scene in the movie. It is. Yeah. This is just the best performance moment. I really hope this was ad-libbed. I really do. <laughs> That would be amazing. That would be like some of the best ad libbing I've ever heard. <laughs> and you know what? It almost seems like it's shot like it's ad libbed because it seems like they're scared to cut away from it. Have you ever like had a moment where like you find out a line was ad libbed and it's just like so bizarre because it's like so integral to like how people perceive the movie? Sure. Like um, the one that I always come to is the Warriors, where it's like at the end of the movie where they're the villain is driving around in the car and he's clanking the beer bottles together and it's just warriors come out to play. Eh? Sure. But also I think of it in terms of like, sometimes directors are like, we need a little bit more of this, you know? Yeah. Sometimes it's like ad libbed in di- a different sense, but definitely in that scene, it seems like they were just going for something and you know, thank God, thank God they didn't cut away from it. Yeah. I'm just really glad they made that decision. Well, cause there's like, no camera, f- yeah, camera flourishes there. It's just like a flat shot of him doing yeah. it. So, like, I wonder if it was just. But him. here we get a weird one. Yeah, where he's talking about the sandworms. He goes out of focus for a second as we like move in on him because <laughs> this is such a serious topic to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Everything about Beetlejuice's introduction is just perfect. Much in the same way that Unshin Andalu changes the way it's weird. Like right at the perfect time, it's weird in one way, and then it stops being weird in that way, and then it's weird in a different way. This scene, his introduction, is like he's weird one way, and then he stops being weird that that way, and then he goes into a different direction, and you're like, what the hell is this? What is going on? And I kind of love it because like the movie was just about to slow down, like you were just getting like, okay, what are we doing? Come on, guys. Yeah, and they're like, we just gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> And then, Jesus Christ, we yeah. got we got a fuck in a PG movie. Uh, I don't know. If, and I could have swore there were two. Um, I think he cuts himself off. I think he goes like, oh, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, because I, I, like, I really thought when I was watching it by myself earlier this week that when Lydia is going to say Beetlejuice and the Maitlands run in and interrupt her as he gets like blown off the side of like the Inferno whorehouse or whatever they yeah. call it. He goes, Don't. fuck you. Um, this is like a really good one, two punch. It is. Um, scenes. I, I want to bring this up quickly cause I'm not sure yeah, about it. Go for it. Um, just so we have this character of, uh, what is it? Bruno or Otho? Otho sorry. Otho. Yeah. Otho. Um, and we have what is to presume to be his wife. Um, who's constantly miserable and hates everything. I assumed that was, I was guessing their like, daughter originally Dick Cavett's daughter, but then cause she leaves with them, but also they seem to have a personal relationship. And also she works at a newspaper cause she knows how much they're offering for the afterlife. Yeah. Um, well, I thought it was a wife and I was wondering cause I'm not really sure on this, but is that like supposed to be coded that like he's gay and he's in a loveless marriage with this woman because like he has to be, but he's definitely coded as gay. Yeah. Um, if only through the flamboyance of the New York, you know, urbane personality that he has, he's yeah. very vain, but he's very into himself. Right. Um, and if that's not coding for gay, that it just very easily could be, you yeah. know, especially in 1988. Hey, and we were talking about what kind of people serve gigantic shrimp as the entree for the meal. Yeah. I mean, I like shrimp. I, lo- I love shrimp cocktails. They're delicious, but like, is that really what you want to eat for the entire meal? No. And those are big ass shrimp too. You got a fucking iconic scene. 
Yeah. Originally, this wasn't going to be the song. This was going to be a song by the Ink Spots that I'm not aware of. Well, I'm I'm aware of the Ink Spots, but I'm kind of very glad that it's Harry Belafonte because yeah. it's just such a weird contrast to everything else. Well, it's like I, it's just the 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 fact that they're you it works because it's all from the same album. Yeah. Right. I think it is because they're all playing it on that album at the beginning. That's why they have this music throughout is because they're playing that album at the start. Yes. And, uh, but it's just a subtle detail. It's just like them listening to it in the attic while they're hanging out there. It's purely the contrast. Yeah. And I love how they're like performing this (laughs) They get into it. And then he's like, what the fuck is going on? I'm not meaning to do this. (laughs) Dick Cavett. And he's trying his best to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Cavett, maybe not the best actor, but a good talk show host. Max, I haven't shown you this clip, but there's a really hilarious clip of him dealing with Norman Mailer on his show when Norman Mailer is drunk. No, you it's haven't really shown hilarious. Clip, I'm sure. <laughs> Norman Mailer Norman Mailer is like, you're my intellectual interferer. He's like what the f- <laughs> you just shut the fuck up norman we were talking about how like they got really good at possession very quickly yeah, well yeah they're animating an entire table of people mm-hmm. and then i love this they think it's done yeah <laughs> <laughs> And I do like how uh, the daughter is spared from that. She just kind of steps back. <laughs> and no. Yeah, because they don't want to do it to Lydia. Yeah. Why would you? But they don't because it wasn't terrifying. It was do you think fun. that scene was a big key to this movie's success? Um, not necessarily that scene, but like just the, I think the Harry Belafonte music in general was, but yeah, like, the con the utter contrast of that scene is just it nails the of, tone of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think between the Beetlejuice introduction and that scene, that's the movie you're selling. I think the thing about that scene that's really neat is that it combines all the elements of this movie in a way that is fresh and interesting and still has something to offer for everybody. Where it has, it's a scene with the family, right? It's the awkward dinner table scene. It's the awkward dinner table but scene. It's also a possession scene. It's a possession scene. It's also class humor, where you have like these rich, snobby upper class people yeah. doing something beneath their station. Um, right, and uh, it's all tied together with the unique twist of just the decision to use that that music. Well, right? yeah, and that music is also perfect for the class comedy type thing um, because. You the song is literally about banana people working all night. Yeah, yeah, like working through the night and like they've harvested bananas all night and they just want to tally my bananas so I could go home. Fucking sleep, please. (laughs) But no, these rich people at a dinner party. And yes, like we said before, nobody valued with yeah Lydia at all before. It's just like oh, there's ghosts and we can do something. Not even a little bit. And they still don't value her because when when they when she says like they're not coming, they don't take her at her word. <laughs> yeah. They leave and then they march right up there to talk to them themselves because Lydia is not good enough to do it because she's a kid, obviously. Yes. And I'm going to ha- let them know a piece of my mind. God damn it. Dick Cavett is a little bit short. <laughs> I didn't know why I noticed that. <laughs> Cause he's short. I guess so. Well, it could be the woman he's standing next to is very tall or has very high heels on. Ouch. (laughs) What is the deal with Otho? What? He's a charlatan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's sort of just like, I'm going to jump on whatever craze can make me money. He's hanging out with... (laughs) the mother because he can make money off of her because she'll just take whatever fucking advice that he has. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think he actually has any other clientele back in New York? I don't know. To do consulting for or whatever. He's hanging out here quite a long time. Yeah. So what, 
what's and, up with that? And he said that he's had a lot of careers. We find out yeah. earlier or later that he was a paranormal investigator for after he was a uh, hair chemist or whatever. Yeah, a hair chemist. <laughs> what does he call it? He calls it something. It's well, not a hair chemist. No, he was just like I knew I knew my chem- I know my chemistry. I used to be a hairstylist briefly. Um, I don't think it was stylist. Well, no, hairstylists have to know it. This is splitting yeah. hairs. Boo. Let's move on. Boo. <laughs> but if you want to talk about inconsistencies and in what moments, why can't he see the ghosts, but why can't he see the handbook for the recently deceased? Yeah, as we discussed, it would make more sense based on the logic of this movie. If like Lydia was trying to yes. hide it or something. And then, and then like, he saw it in her hands. Yes. She was holding it. That made it visible because the thing about Otho is that he is a charlatan and he's off to capitalize off of just trends or fads. He's very aware of what is normal and accepted, right? Yeah. That is how he lives. Whereas uh, Lydia, the reason why the book and the ghosts are, visible to her she hypothesizes is because she is often um overlooked herself because she is strange and unusual yes there's otho is not strange and unusual in that way well i i don't know like where this idea came from but like i was always under them because you said the stepmother thing i was always under the impression she could see the ghosts because like she saw her mother die or something like that it was like something like that but i think that's just Does that like come a- from harry potter that, well, that is a thing in Harry Potter. Um, I didn't even think of that. But uh, I don't know. Maybe that was just like a thing I dreamed up one time. But like, Stop stealing J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Um, but that's like, it doesn't matter why she can see the ghosts. And There's a lot of things that like, you're just like, why is this a thing? And then like, I don't really care. Well, the tone of this movie carries it. But yeah. that doesn't, and the movie isn't quite focused on stuff like that. But in terms of stuff like the rules with Beetlejuice... This movie is good enough to get away with not giving you that information, but that, that that doesn't change the fact that you don't know those rules, you yeah. know? And that if in a lesser movie with a worse cast, that movie wouldn't get away with doing that. Well, yeah, because like we talked about a lot in our bird box commentary, um, how just like this world doesn't have any consistent rules and it ruins the movie. So like me saying like, Oh, it doesn't matter. People are going to, that's a good comparison. That's hypocritical. I'm like, no, because this movie is fun and entertaining enough. Yeah. And it's not necessarily a premise based movie or no, like, whereas bird box is entirely based on the premise of, right. Well, this is a character piece. Yes. And a stylistic fun. Yeah, film, rather than just like a strictly narrative creature feature. This movie prioritizes character relationships, you know? And perhaps that would be strengthened by very, not even very well-defined rules, but just a little bit more information about how it works in general, right? Or why Beetlejuice is different from other ghosts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But the movie is not crippled when you don't have that information, because it has so much going on in terms of character relationships. Whereas Bird Box is just, is just fucking vacant. It's just empty. Because if you take out Beetlejuice from this movie, like you still have a film. Yeah, we were talking about that. It's, like, it's weird because you can kind of excise him and you still have the same conflict going on. Yeah. If you take out the invisible monsters from Bird Box, you don't have a movie anymore. Yeah. That's the point is like, it's more high concept. Whereas again, the idea of this bio exorcist or whatever is high concept, but it's just a piece within a movie about like two families trying to get along. Yeah. (laughs) So it's like, I don't know. It's everything in this movie is jammed together. This movie is rich with ideas and I don't even want to talk about bird box anymore. I know. I just thought it was, I thought we should address that in case some, no, that is a good point of comparison. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it does help characterize this movie in terms of being something like uh, a movie that that uh, succeeds in spite of its failings because of its its strengths are so compelling, you know? Yeah, we have Dante's Inferno Room. Yeah. Max, are these, do these women, they have goat horns, they have devil horns. 
Are they demons? Yes, sure. They dressed up as demons? Why not? Oh, Max, it's air conditioned. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, that's important. Well, you might think it's super hot in there because it's called Dante's Inferno. Whoa! Paperwork. Whoa. Daylight. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So apparently Juno can just summon them to them. So Juno has powers as well. And Juno is responsible for the whorehouse, yeah. as she calls it. Juno's basically God, honestly. <laughs> she basically is. Can you imagine if people went to church and then like Juno's face just appeared <laughs> on a TV screen and she just started yelling at them? All, what do you want? You're all a bunch of fucking idiots. Just fill out the fucking paperwork. I don't want to hear from you. <laughs> I do love fun bureaucratic humor. Like, oh, uh, God. I think that um, a movie I would like to do in the future at some point is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is... Oh, uh, not Brazil? Well, Bra- yeah, we could do Brazil, but... Like, I, well, I was thinking, like, in reference to this one. This one is, like, yeah. super Brazil with this stuff. Yeah, There's yeah, something yeah. so interesting about like the way Sylvia Sidney does the grumpy old lady yeah. thing. I don't know what it is that's different about it. The is that supposed to be a mirror? Okay, we were talking about this. In how they were producing the stuff, the thing behind them, if you look in the little like between the curtains, you see just a bunch of dead people over there. The idea was supposed to be that it was like another movie audience a dead movie audience that's watching the movie and this movie is like a two way mirror, you know? Yeah. But it's it does not come across at all. No, it's just such a small little detail. Like uh, when I, I always thought that was just like another waiting room. And honestly, because this movie does literally nothing else to try to convince you that that's a movie theater. I don't care what their intent is. It is just a waiting room. in the movie. Yeah. So I know they were trying to go for that, it just is a waiting room in the movie yeah. as this movie exists. Cause that shit ain't in the movie. <laughs> that would be interesting to do. If you had moments like that, you could play with different ideas about like, we could, we could then be citing, you know, vocab terms, Max Christian Metz vocab terms about the projective and introjective screen and what that means when you're watching a movie. And she's writing her, would be very exciting. Goth, sad poetry, suicide note. It She does play this moment really well. Yeah. It would have been so easy for this character to just be annoying. And cringeworthy. Um, I mean, it is cringeworthy, but in a way that's like... No, not really. They, they go for something. It's not like unintentionally cringeworthy. But it's like, I'm going to kill myself. I'm alone. I am utterly alone. I have to plummet off the top of this <laughs> it's very well done and i know as i was mentioning to you that you got to check out the movie mirror mirror and check out rainbow harvest in that movie if you like lydia deets yeah and that's a recommendation both for max and anybody i figured you were talking lydia. more to the uh, no yeah audience than me i mean but. well it's a horror movie it's a good horror movie from that time it's neat it got a sequel i think mark ruffalo was in the sequels oh god yeah. So I guess if you're a big Mar- Mark Ruffalo fan. That's my secret cap. I'm always scared. Don't say things like that. <laughs> That's not even the worst joke we've made today. <laughs> not yet, anyway. <laughs> we still have plenty of time. That comes out. That That's later. That's after the podcast. You people don't even know. Oh, my God. The amount of shit we go through. <laughs> we save you with editing. We there's a list of bars and other establishments that just don't let us in because the jokes are too bad. Now, Max, which person do you think is creepier? Which face? Obviously hers. Yeah. Why? Um, because I totally agree, and I also think it's obvious. The flesh, the fleshy parts. The uh, I would say, um, the fact that you can like see the exposed gums and the teeth and the eyeballs and then like. You can just sort of see the skin on his and then sort of see the eyeballs on his fingers. Is it also because like his eyes still seem like they're in the right place, even though that's technically his nostrils, right? Kind of. Yeah. Um, and her eyes are just in her mouth and you're like, Ooh, what, what? They had that prop, the headpiece of hers at the Tim Burton art exhibit. I That's pretty it. cool. I, they had such fun stuff. There. Did they have this uh, this 
model. No, they did arena. not. Unfortunately, god damn. They had a lot of it. A lot of it was um, <laughs> miniatures from Nightmare Before Christmas and the Corpse Bride. Ghost with the most, babe. Yeah, I love those lines. <laughs> Max, uh, one day I want to know if you're able to pick someone up at a bar by saying, I'm the ghost with the most, babe. <laughs> Just see how that goes. It's like trying to use uh, Dance Magic Dance from Labyrinth as a pickup line. Just like go up to someone who's like, you remind me of the babe. <laughs> 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 what? You know the babe? The babe with the, the power. The babe with the power. <laughs> Oh my god! I can't think of a more embarrassing way <laughs> to try to talk some. <laughs> oh man, I bet somebody's done that too. Yeah, it's like a, <laughs> it's failed miserably. It's a bet. Oh man, I gotta, I gotta get somehow like force you into a situation where you have to do. That. <laughs> Not even as like picking somebody up, but just like go talk to somebody. Buy me a couple of drinks at a bar, and I will do that in a second. You hear that, listeners? <laughs> We're going to do our first live recording. For Patreon our, pledges of... Our meetup session. Yeah. For Patreon pledges of $8 million or more. Ma- Max is just going to be standing outside at a predetermined location. <laughs> and, uh... Hey. I love how they do the game of charades, too. Yeah. And she does a very good job going through like the rate, like <laughs> the process of figuring it out. I think that's a very hard thing to do as an actor to be like, Gen- what? Genuinely. Beetle, beetle, uh, breakfast, breakfast, beetle. And it's like annoying to us because we already know his name, but like, it, I don't think it's annoying. I think she does a good enough job that it's like, well, no, I'm saying like, oh, come on, get it. But it's just like, if you don't fucking know, then yeah, it makes sense. Why was it Beetlejuice, by the way? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I really don't. Is it just because it sounds neat? I don't know. And it's a star? Do we want to talk about what this movie was originally going to be named? Whoa, well, well, I mean, he always wanted to name it Beetlejuice. Yes. But the thing is, the studio is dumb. They sort of came up with this idea for a movie called House Ghosts. As in, like, house guests. Uh-huh. And then Tim Burton was like, haha, that's very funny. How about scared sheetless? Because he was annoyed. Yeah. like, And they, they were like, Tim, that's... this is why we pay you the big bucks. Scared <laughs> sheetless. He was apparently mortified to learn that they yeah, liked they'd that. They loved that idea. <laughs> and then he's like, fuck you. We got to go back to Beetlejuice or nothing. And they're like, Tim, we thought you were going in a good direction. <laughs> We thought we could trust you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You fooled us. Yeah, to be fair, I slightly understand Tim Burton just decaying if he's had to deal with that for so many <laughs> years. Yeah, he's like, but, after Scared Cheatless, it was just a little bit different. Yeah. Because, I mean, what type of fucking sense that makes as a title is completely beyond me. Do you think this movie might have bombed if they actually like it was if the, they called it Scared Sheetless? It was yes. the same exact yeah. same film. Yeah, it totally would have bombed. <laughs> because Beetlejuice, even though he's not a huge part of the movie, you know, you see him on the on the one sheet, you're like, who is that? And yeah. then you see Beetlejuice, and you're like, what is that? It's its own but thing. But you assume it's like his name, and you're like, oh, it's like a <laughs> God. <laughs> That's disturbing. Uh, but you're like, oh, that's a weird name. I'm going to learn who that is, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost kind of like a Pee Wee Herman situation. Kind of, yeah. Herman is a more normal name. But you're like, oh, I can see that that's like Beetlejuice. You know? That's something that you can hang your hat on in terms of marketing. Whereas Scared Sheetless just sounds stupid. Yeah. You can't infer, at, like, you can't kind of decide what kind of movie it is by just looking at the title because like i see a movie called scared sheetless i'm like okay it's gonna be a very 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 dumb comedy about it ghosts. tries too too much yeah. to tell you what it is whereas beetlejuice is just like it is just the trope of a character name but it's like what is that hey also interesting to note that the insect museum is uh 
is located at the hardware store, the Maitland hardware store. So again, you have that weird subtext carried through where there's like an association between like them losing their life and like bugs. Yeah. But I don't know. I do think the idea of a, uh, <laughs> a Marcel Marceau statue that apparently the only thing it does is speak is uh, really hilarious to me. We've made a number of Doug Jones jokes throughout this commentary track, but much like Marcel Marceau, Doug Jones was trained as a mime. Did you know yes, that? Yes, I did know that. Yeah, that's weird. And then he started getting uh, bits and commercials where they had to like, dress somebody up. And he was also in a Tim Burton movie very early in his career. He was in uh, The Return of Batman. What's the second Batman? With the Penguin? Oh, uh, that's not Batman Forever, is no. it? No. Um, I, I don't know. I can't think of it. Batman like, again. Yeah. <laughs> this time for real. <laughs> <laughs> Batman 2. Electric Boogaloo. No. Your sister is a penguin. <laughs> oh, God. This is such an amazing, like, casual burn from Lydia. It's just the <laughs> villain of your movie, and it's like, wait, why am I frightened? You can't do shit. <laughs> I'm not even going to pretend that 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 book is, like, not important as, like, some sort of reverse psychology to get you to give it to me. I'm just going to be like... No, you can't even fucking do anything. So I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the delivery of that was fucking perfect too. Yeah. She's really great in this movie. I can't think of many other roles from her that like stand out to me like immediately. Heather's is a big one. Yeah. But like, what are her big roles? You know? I feel like most people too would be like Heather's or this, you know? I think that's where she gets a lot of her cred from. Which is not to say she's like a bad actor, but no, I think she really hit it the hit it out of the park as a as a kid actor. Well, she was in Edward Scissorhands too. Um, yeah, but she's kind of more bland in that. She's not like quite as like lively. I don't think people remember her from that movie. They just remember Johnny Depp. Oh, and, you know what? No, uh. Winona Ryder in a fucking Girl Interrupted, too. I think she was great in that. Um, I enjoy that movie. James but Mangold movie. I like that movie. Um, you like Gorilla Interrupted. I know that about you. What? <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell you about just saying things? <laughs> you do. I know you do. I don't... <laughs> oh, God. And then we have this weird thing where, uh, again, carrying through this strange subtext of this movie, they are made... Max! Maxie Dean, turn off your phone. It's time to relax. We're in Connecticut. I was reading my note, my the notes, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so the weird subtext again is that we're going to get the scene where they are reunited as a family under these weird circumstances, but in a sense, in a way that will destroy them. You could almost see it as them, like, once again being forced to conform to this image of what the family is in a way, but they can't, so they're going to just dissolve and disappear. Wither away. Yeah. They're, like, withering away because they're being, instead of, like, existing on their own terms, they're being forced to exist. They're they're a spectacle yeah. for these out-of-towners to enjoy. And but they're put in a box that yes. destroys them. It's a Procrustean bed. It's going to lop off their limbs and their heads. And then their individuality will be destroyed. Doesn't that scare you? Slightly. Not as much as her crumpling away as a ghost. I don't know. I didn't prepare myself for this. Yeah, this is a good performance moment from him. The fact that uh, Otho is, uh, the unflappable Otho is now, you know. Flustered and. He doesn't know what to do. Yeah. He's scared. He actually apologizes. <laughs> this is literally the only time in which that character would apologize after he's already killed somebody. <laughs> Not even killing somebody. It's He's fucking up their business propositions yeah. if those ghosts wither away. That's true. You don't want that to happen. Yeah. And then Beetlejuice finally shows up with his iconic outfit. Yeah. Max, this was your Halloween outfit for every year. 
No. Um, my little sister actually did go as a uh, Edward Scissorhands one year. Um, oh, that's interesting. I'm trying to think if I ever dressed up as any Tim Burton characters. Um, I think I dressed up as Sweeney Todd one year. Um, we were also joking that it would be really funny if every time Batman got out of his suit, it was just Beetlejuice. <laughs> like, that's just how he looked. You take his suit <laughs> off, and then it's just like you got the weird hair that's like green. And then <laughs> it's just, and that would explain like the eye makeup thing. Well, it's funny because he's closer to like the penguin in this movie. <laughs> that's <laughs> than true. He is yeah. To Batman. Definitely. Oh my God. Can you imagine if Danny DeVito was Beetlejuice instead? <laughs> That would be... It wouldn't be bad. It would be Yeah, fun. that would be interesting. Yeah. Danny DeVito. He's, I love Danny DeVito. He's friends with Tim Burton, too. He gave a great performance in uh, Big Fish. I really liked it. But um, Was he the fish? No, he was a werewolf carnival barker. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> That's definitely... There's yeah. Jack Skellington. Yes, which you pointed out to me. I'd never noticed that before. Yeah. I don't know if the movie was in production at this time, but obviously stop motion animation takes a long time to complete. Yeah. So... At well, any rate, they and he had knew... Ri- he had written the poem before this movie oh, was made. Oh, God, that's right. It's adapted from a poem. Mm. <laughs> Fuck off. Uh, oh, God. It's just... I, if there's one thing I do really appreciate about Tim Burton, it is his uh, appreciation for carnival barkers <laughs> and uh, snake oil salesmen. I love that. I love William Castle. I think... I love anybody who really likes those things. This is sort of like Freddy Krueger esque almost. Yeah. It's the only time that like Beetlejuice becomes a slasher movie villain and just <laughs> murders people. Cause they have to be dead, right? He totally just killed them. Yeah. We never see them again. Do we? <laughs> yeah. He just launched them into the, like the sky. It's like in a cartoon when somebody goes into the sky and then you see a twinkle as they disappear. I assume it's just like that. And Max, that's why he won't do two shows tonight anymore. That is true. He won't do it, babe. He won't do it. (laughs) Yet again, it's just like, this is so interesting after learning that Michael Keaton just made up most of his dialogue for this shit. And was just like, let's see how much fun I can get away with for this. And then people have to play off of him. I'm assuming that's why a lot lot of the actors are kind of just quiet when he's doing it because they didn't know how to respond. Oh, no. Look how unfashionable I am. Although, also, it's definitely a matter of the other actors not really getting good moments with Beetlejuice. Really, if you think about it, it's mostly Winona Ryder yeah. and uh, the Maitlands. And as an actor, I think it would be like actually very useful to have this performance because I, you, it's almost like he's a prop yeah. in every scene he's in. You know, how can you not respond to him? it would probably be great to act with him because you're always on the back foot and that always reinforces your character, you know? But if you can keep up with him, that's the thing. The amount of energy that would be the question, creativity yeah. he's yeah. bringing to these scenes is ridiculous. But like, how do you know? Are you ready for the next thing? I guess would always be the question. <laughs> oh, God. I just... We have visual gags. Yeah. It just, it's pretty great. The movie just keeps moving on. It doesn't d- dedicate an entire scene to those visual gags. They just kind of happen. And then we see the foreshadowing will be paid off here. The, where The horrific art that she's just like, oh, my art is very dangerous. Yeah, and she was trapped by it before. Yeah. And I think she will also be trapped by the same piece of artwork. It's <laughs> animated like a monster from The Thing. <laughs> it's going to just consume her. It looks like it doesn't want to be alive. It's just like, ah, kill me. She is trapped by the exact same one. Look at that. Yeah. Foreshadowing. I also like that it like forces her hat down over her eyes so she can't (laughs) see anything. Oh, man. And it's also, it's forcing him to sit down. If I ever get married, I want the priest to wear that outfit. If I ever get married, I'd wear this outfit. Just uh, this? I'm yeah. talking about this. I want the priest to wear that. I'd wear the tuxedo if my yeah if I end up marrying a woman. She's down to yeah wear that. Why not? It'd be fun. Um, but I was going to say that the father's forced to sit down on the sculpture when he was trying to force himself to sit down and relax for the entirety of the movie. Oh, there you go. So you have a nice little foreshadowing there too. But this entire ending is just more evidence of why I feel like the structure of this movie is sloppy, but you just don't care because it's too energetic and fun. And they do bring back the little details that 
are mentioned throughout the rest of the movie. Yeah, right? like he can throw his voice, like that whole thing, or like right. limitations. But structurally, it doesn't make sense that this is happening all of a sudden now. Is that the big like thing they have to solve is the marriage plot? Yeah. <laughs> but if you do look at you know. Beetlejuice is this type of like underbelly character. If he's this movie's Frank Frank Booth, which is really weird, but if he is this movie's Frank Booth, right? Okay, you could see the marriage plot idea as like some idea of like legitimizing. <laughs> <laughs> I just love his little like squeal that he gives. Um, you could see this marriage plot as something that's like you know subtextually sort of legitimizing him into the actual image of America that they're chasing and they don't want him in it. You know, they don't want this scummy. Yeah. Lower class. Yeah. Snake oil salesman. Carn- so I don't Carnival know. Barker. Yeah. They want to separate it. So I don't know. But again, the movie isn't really focused on that subtext. So it's hard to really go but there. It doesn't need to be. No, it does not. Because, again, the character relationships are just too strong. Although I am really curious how she tamed that sandworm. <laughs> Maybe she went up to it like with the same thing that Beetlejuice did, where he's just like, sandworms, you hate them, right? And just went up to the sandworm, was just like, Beetlejuice, you hate them, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, I love that little miniature. I wish big movies would do that more frequently, where it, like it's not like alienating to you, but you could tell something was a miniature. Yeah. Maybe I think that might just be us because we find miniatures so charming and fun. But, but it's always entertaining. It is. Even if you were not aware of that stuff, <laughs> you would I love how the priest looks too. Like, wow, that just Fuck. happened. Yeah. The priest is like, <laughs> Well, I guess this marriage is over. What do I do now? I guess you guys don't need me anymore. Uh uh, uh yeah, I'm still here. I don't know what to do. <laughs> this is awkward for all of us. <laughs> I guess I'll marry you too. You're wearing uh you're wearing what looks like clothes you're going to be married in. Oh, I'll just burst into a flame. Bye. <laughs> That's what happens when Max leaves every every day. He just snaps his fingers. It's catches lucky on that fire. the one school in this town is a school for girls. Yeah. Is is this Miss um, Madame Peregrine's school? What was that movie he did? Oh God. Madame per- Peregrine, like a peregrine falcon. I heard that wasn't even like. It wasn't terrible. It was just. Ever. It was what it was. Yeah. It was like somebody made a Tim Burton movie who wasn't Tim Burton. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's shocking. And this is, yet again, another one of the most iconic scenes in the movies. Oh, God. Because we get, everybody gets a happy ending, which. Although normal- it's a little bit weird that her, like, celebration for getting a good grade on the math test is what possession yeah but she enjoys it she has always enjoyed like the close I, to death stuff if you wanted to fly around i understand but also i would feel weird like if you're the ghost how do you do that deliberately is it like you have this invisible arm that you're lifting somebody with yeah i don't want to touch somebody well if we're assuming that if they can do it for multiple people maybe it's just like a mind thing and yeah maybe they none of them disappear while it's happening so maybe it's the calypso music yeah Yep, it's his music will just lift you up into the air. It's that <laughs> it's that uplifting. It is really good music yeah. on its own. Uh, I kind of just don't want to talk over this because I just want to enjoy it. It's a rare yeah, moment. It's really good. Um, it's, again, this classic structure we always yes. go back to. On the front, it says from the author for the handbook for the recently deceased. So Juno just kind of gave them a magazine. To, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I, uh, what was I going to say? I completely, oh, so yeah, this, this ending scene is very much the idea of that synthesis structure yeah. we have. And again, we have this idea that yes, Lydia has found her family, her foster family, and they have found their foster child in her. And they now are truly embodying that idea of the American dream. And there's yeah. no impediment to that. Um, the father can finally react yeah, relax. The mother yes. has finally found everything has been synthesized, and art and Beetlejuice has to suffer at the hands of the bureaucracy he left. Yeah, and then both this man <laughs> and the witch doctor who did that to his head are in hell. <laughs> I 
Hey, it's me waiting at the DMV. Who does he say? He says like Elvis, right? <laughs> it's interesting that he knows who Elvis is, despite well, how old he is. But he also, oh, uh, I guess well, he's a bio exorcist. Well, no, because he references seeing the exorcist like 167 100. times. Yes. So like he's in movie theaters. He's kept with it. Like he's trying to stay with it because like he's referencing like carnival barkers. He's tr- like doing corny car sales. He's got his, TV yeah, commercials. He, he knows what's up. Yeah. Yeah. Beetlejuice is a crafty guy. This is the second time that Elvis has been referenced in a row because we just, he was just referenced in Men in yep, Black. Yeah, we got Bo Welch. We've got uh, Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. He's Tom- one of those football players. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, but what a good time. I, that was. If they were going to make a sequel, would they call it Beetlejuice? Juice? Beetlejuice? Juice? Beetle. Beetlejuice second. Juice. Beetlejuice second serving. Oh, uh, there you go. But yeah, I hope they don't make a sequel because un- I really hope. Because <laughs> unfortunately, Mr. Burton, I'm sorry. You, you, I have to give you credit. You were one of the reasons that I sort of to get into film. But you have lost a step. Yeah, just, just retire. I, I know it's awkward because Lena Bonham Carter broke up with you. Um, but just like, well, God, you don't have to make it fucking personal, Max. Jesus. He's not listening. And then you say, I'm the negative one. You don't have to go after Tim Burton. Just I'm not. tell him that his movies suck ass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Burton. This but... is the last movie of yours we'll be doing on this show. Uh, I don't know about that. We'll see. Yeah, I don't but... know. He's got a, quite a few good ones, but yeah. But, uh, yeah, that, that was Beetlejuice. Um, thank you for listening to the spectator film podcast. Yeah, I really don't think I have much else to say about it. No, I think we covered it, but it's just a very enjoyable movie. Yeah. I think that this, it's a rare occasion where we can just sort of just be like, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. But this is one of those cases. Uh, anyway, I'm Max. He's and Austin. I'm Austin. Yes. He's Austin. Um, do you want to tell the kind people where they can listen to more of our podcast? Spectatorfieldpodcast.com, where we have episodes that will link you to uh, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher, and uh, everywhere else. That fine podcasts are sold. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, uh, yes. if you So, if you say spectator three times, will this podcast end? Do you want to find out? Yeah, why don't you do it? Spectator, spectator, spectator. Oh, no, it didn't. Fuck. (laughs) Anyway, bye, everyone. (laughs)